Okay, well, I'm, I'm, um, I'm going to give a, a presentation this morning on translanguaging, which is a, a, a new topic in applied linguistics. Um, the ter this term um, is everywhere in the literature on bilingualism, multilingualism, and language education. It has a a bright, uh, uh, the air of a bright new star in our galaxy, and yet it, um, as we see, it goes back um, a long way. Um, it goes back to more more than twenty five years, actually, and it originates in the Celtic fringe of Great Britain, in the domain of the teaching of Welsh. Strange that a, a term which has um, become so popular and uh, so fashionable. Uh, had its origins in in the, the teaching of a Celtic language in Britain. Okay, um, but it has been uh, gone through a lot of uh, changes since its invention. It was been polished up and reconditioned by a whole range of researchers. Okay, um, it strayed quite far from its original usage, which we'll look at. Uh, in the environment of pedagogy, language pedagogy, and, and it's got involved in a more uh, um, a, a greater range of contexts and controversies. Indeed, it's it's now uh, involved in in a in a very um, powerful controversy outside the area of pedagogy. Okay, um, and the question is: Has um, its current diversity? of usage changed it beyond recognition, even moved it beyond intelligibility. Um, it's been redef redefined multiple times in, in, in so many, many ways. Um, uh, my, one of my colleagues uh, tells me it has at least 17 definitions, um, and that's probably a conservative estimate. Okay. And um, it's there, 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 there could be problems in in terms of in terms of how precisely how precisely we should interpret it. Okay, but we're going to go um, be, uh, we're going to have a fairly narrow focus today. Okay? And I'm not going to um, uh, go into the meanings acquired by this term in the domain of naturalistic. Uh, by a, a multilingualism. Okay, it, it has it has moved out of the pedagogical sphere, but we're going to we're going to stay with within pedagogical uh, concerns. Okay, no. so I'm going to focus on the, uh, the pedagogical usages of translanguaging. Um, whatever else you, we may say, we must acknowledge that. In the pedagogical and the naturalistic sphere, the use of different languages beside each other in the same context, which is basically what translanguaging is about, is hardly a new idea. Um, I, I live in Ireland, uh, where, where a great preoccupation is the teaching of Irish, which is um, uh, spoken by only a, as a native language by only a very small minority, minority of Irish people. But Irish is the, the first national language of Ireland. In the Constitution of Ireland, it's the first national language. Uh, it's a symbol of Irish independence and, and, and autonomy. Okay, uh, So uh, I, I'm going to talk a bit about Irish. Uh, but in the Irish context, as Flynn points out, the, um, the practice of alternation between Irish and English in both pedagogical and non-pedagogical contexts has a long, very long history. Um, Irish is largely taught through Irish. We'll, we'll see that later. Um, but um, uh, and there, there, there have been arguments for um, the use of translanguaging in, in the teaching of Irish contexts. But um, certainly this, this idea of using English alongside Irish is it's not a new idea okay in uh, teaching of Irish as in other, other spheres of language teaching as we'll see. Um, the term translanguaging is, a, is um, a, a translation of the Welsh term okay uh, 
had coined by Kinlanians in the 1980s and used in his PhD theories. Um, I'm not going to try and pronounce, I'm not going to try and pronounce the, the Welsh word because I don't have expertise in Welsh. But the situation in Wales is a bit like the situation in Ireland in the sense that a Celtic language is being revived and, and widely taught. Welsh um, having been neglected for many, many years, centuries, in the education system of Wales, is now very much up there with English as a, as a, 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 as a language used and taught in Wales, just as Irish is in Ireland, okay? Um, anyway, the person who trans first translated this term into, into English was Colin Baker, who was one of Ken William Williams' uh, colleagues. And he also, uh, Colin Baker did much popularize it in his, um, in his famous foundations of um, bilingual education uh, and um, bilingualism. <clears throat> so translanguaging originally referred to the use of English alongside Welsh in Welsh language classes. That's, that's, that's uh, it's a simple definition. Uh, in, in its original usage, okay. Um, is that this was um, on, on this departure was done was uh, affected on the basis of a more positive evaluation uh, than previously of bilingualism. Okay, so you, you, those of you that, that know about the history of, of bilingualism in the academic sphere will, will know that. Um, if you go back to the 50s, um, bilingualism was not very well looked, seen uh, in the academic world. Um, it was regarded um, as, as uh, something to be go overcome, okay? But bilingualism since the 1960s, I would say, in the 70s, has um, had a different kind of feel to it. It's regarded more positively. It's um, it, it's seen as a basis of of, of um, a good interaction between the languages in question, and it's seen as uh, having positive benefits for bilinguals. Okay, um, so I'll I'll, um, I'll just give you two quotations uh, about um, concerning the background and beginnings of. Um, uh, the term translanguaging. <clears throat> this is um, from Ken Williams himself. I mean, he talks about translanguaging about, about as, as receiving information through, through, through the medium one language, e.g. English, and using it, uh, using it uh, through the medium of the other language, for example, Welsh. Uh, the, he says that you have to understand the information before you can communicate it. And um, so that's, that's maybe one reason why um, using um, English, which is the majority language in Wales, is, is a good idea, okay? Um, um, another quote from Lewis et al. has to do with that, this different view of um, bilingualism and also Welsh language revitalization, which was um, rather slow to begin with, but um, in the end became quite successful. Uh, it's quite successful now in Wales. And this, um, Lewis and I'll say, uh, opens up the possibility of the two languages, Welsh and English, as being um, seen as mutually advantageous. In, in schools and, 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 and other contexts and society at large. Um, to go back to the Irish situation, um, a recent Irish study um, concerning the teaching of uh, the Irish language um, uh, also used translanguage. I mean, the teachers and the students responded positively to translanguaging material. 
they um that the students when they when they see when they found they were being confronted with English as well as well uh, as Irish in their classes they they responded positively they no, no longer saw it as a boring subject you know this is the problem with Irish that the um, um, the, the general problem that Irish is very a very different language kind of language from English very different um, and um, a lot of students react negatively to, to Irish um, but um, and they found that the use of English in Irish classes improved the situation of, of um, improved their understanding and, and improved their enjoyment of the Irish classes in question. Moriarty concludes that a more flexible approach to the teaching of Irish, um, uh, one which speaks to the students' personal experience of languages, makes the learning of Irish more fun. So this is a, this is a very positive um, uh, response to this translanguaging notion. As I as I said, it's uh, this this um, this might have to do with the fact that Irish is traditionally taught through Irish via Irish, which is a very different kind of language from English. So that more translanguaging in normally English would have given the students in a certain some relief, and this might have been part of the reason for the, the students' enthusiasm for translanguaging. Anyway, um, a pedagogical understanding of translanguaging is still very much with us. I, I've said that translanguaging has strayed beyond the pedagogical sphere, but um, it, the a pedagogical understanding is still with us. The, the, for example, we see this in the work of Thanos, who uh, focuses entirely on the, still on, on the pedagogical dimension. She doesn't get involved at all in, in the uh, uh, the other areas of uh, the other de uh, definitions of bi of, of um, translanguaging. Um, right. So um, the original context, a concept of translanguaging, has been extended, as we as we said along the. Uh, well beyond the classroom. Um, it strayed into the world of nationalistic bilingualism, multilingualism, okay, but trans, tra, translanguaging in, in its original pedagogical uses, the usage is still with us. In the naturalistic context, the, the concept of translanguaging has become embroiled in disputation over whether or not it makes sense to regard individual named languages as having any kind of autonomy. Um, Garcia, for example, no longer accepts that different languages are, have any kind of separate existence. She sees that them all as involving in a mishmash. Uh, and this is very much a controversial um, assertion, um, given all kinds of evidence um, from other spheres, okay? But anyway, we won't go into that. Uh, this is uh, some, an area which I've been involved in myself, and I think we'll, we'll stick to pedagogy for the moment. Okay. Okay, so um, pedagogy. Well, translanguaging views of the use of more than one language in class as teeming with signs from here, there, and everywhere rather than straightforwardly uh, language A plus language B, okay? And, and we can, one, one can agree with this broad sweep reconceptualization, which may have many benefits uh, in, trying to, uh, in regard to challenging the notion that language in all circumstances, or languages in all circumstances, have to be kept uh, strictly apart, okay? Um, we can, of course, note that uh, translanguaging is not the first methodology 
that um, as an use um, of uh, the, the learners L1 alongside the Taka language, okay? There indeed has been a continuum of L1 use within various language, uh, uh, within various L2 teaching methods. Some indeed going back to ancient times, you know, we'll, we'll come out to that uh, in, a, in a moment or two, okay? Um, Uh, there have always been uh, language uh, educationists who have pointed to the theoretical and practical advantages of some degree of L1 use in the, in the L2 classroom, okay, in particular, uh, in particular circumstances. Uh, for example, um, in the natural approach, um, Krushen and Terrell, allow for responses in the, the L1, even when the input is the L2, and they recommend that teachers inform students of this at the start of the course. Yeah? Many versions of communicative language teaching, uh, including the versions um, used in Britain and Ireland for the teaching of continental languages, have always allowed for, indeed sometimes encouraged, some L1 use within the L2 classes, okay. Um, and, and Cook uh, uh, points out that the belief that teachers should discourage or even ban the use of the L1 in the L2 classroom was in part um, rooted in the, in the dubious idea that successful L2 acquisition was dependent on keeping the L1 and the L2 completely separate. For example, um, uh, a lot of versions of audiovisual or audiolingual language teaching, which was used in America and, and some parts of Europe, um, actually did put a strict ban on, on any use of the L1 in the classroom. And this was a this was a uh, um, a, a, a situation. Which, which existed for a very long time. I remember when I was teaching in France in the 1970s, I was strictly forbidden, according to the rules of the, of, of the uh, discipline, to, to, to use English, uh, to use French in my English classes. Okay? So um, yeah, there have been quite dogmatic uh, points of view which exactly contradict the translanguaging idea. But the, the current translanguaging movement is, appears not to, to be rooted in a more I, uh, evolved ideological foundation than these other methods which used L1, uh, allowed the use of L1. Um, the, 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 the aims of the translanguaging movement seem to go beyond just promoting L1 and L2 use, or allowing um, for the most uh, um, L1 and L2 use in the, in the language classroom. Um, it, its perspective um, seeks to recognize the value of multilingual practices and interlingual, inter, intercultural values. So it's not just, uh, translanguaging, it's not just about allowing L1 use in the L2 class. It's about um, developing a notion that the use of L1 alongside L2 is, is, a, is, a, uh, is a very good thing, is, um, is uh, a very good idea from, a, from an ideological point of view. Um, having said all that, has to recognize that the proponents of trial damaging probably have more in common with the ideas and practices um, um, of, um, of some practitioners and promoters, language, language matter, or is with the use of learners first language at, at all that is generally acknowledged. Okay. <laughs> On the, on the other hand, the simple fact of using more than one language in class may bear little relation to 
um, current definitions of um, child language. Okay. Um, for example, uh, one of the methods that uh, was used a lot um, in, in previous days was the grammatization method or, or the classical method, which as this last name indicates, was actually the approach used in ancient Rome to teach ancient Greek. This, um, this, this methodology, this, this um, way of language teaching survived um, two millennia, okay? And it was the approach used uh, in, for example, all English and Irish schools to teach languages up until quite recently. In this methodology, the language instruction was a student's first language, and the materials were all oriented towards illustrating the grammatical rules of the target language and towards developing skills in translating into and out of this language. Hence, the name of the, the methodology, grammar translation, okay? Uh, it was a method which, you, which, uh, which you, was used on me um, I was educated in the 1960s, and, and uh, still uh, in the 1960s, this was the method used in my grammar school to teach me all the language that I learned in that grammar school, Latin, but also French and German. And I have to say, it didn't work too badly. I, I learned, I, I, I got a grip of, a good grip of French and German. Mind you, I, I, I went to France and Germany on visits, so that helped. But um, it, for me, it worked quite well. But, uh, but I doubt if it will be recommended by, by many advocate, advocates for old trans languaging, even though the old one is used alongside the old two. Uh, indeed, the, the grammatization methodology has been belittled and uh, attacked by virtually all advocates of every progressive uh, language teaching method from the beginning of the 20th century onwards. And, and, and I, would, I said that it was used in my grammar school in the, the 1960s, but um, uh, from the beginning of the 20th century or before the beginning of the 20th century, it was being attacked by um, advocates of more progressive methodologies. Um, this contempt uh, in which the, this methodology is held um, uh, is, is in spite of the fact that many of, of the elements of grammatization methodology have been revivified. So one of the components of the gram of grammatization, which has been um, re given a better press in uh, recent times, is, is, is tra translation itself. Translation was in the cold for, for a very long time in progressive language teaching. Uh, and uh, in, in, despite the fact that some early um, uh, advocates of communicative language teaching see, saw a role for translation, Widowson, for example, met, recommends the incorporation of translation into the uh, communicative approach. But it, by and large, translation has been um, ignored or, or um, criticized in recent times. But in more recent times, so it's been re, re, uh, revivified, re, uh, given a given a, a new a new role. Um, I, I think the 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 um, the redevelopment of translation as as a uh, element of language teaching as as, as um, been treated with with caution, um, including uh, in relation to translanguage, because of its its overuse in the past. Perhaps, perhaps translation was was virtually the only method um, um, 
methodological um, dimension of, um, of the grammatization was overused. Um, um, given, however, that persuasive arguments are, are now being used as uh, used in, in favor of translation as pedagogical matters, and given that involve, it involves more than one language, one would have thought that it ought to be, um, have some appeal um, to those who favor translanguaging. So translanguaging, um, in any way, uh, the, 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 the uh, theoretical um, treatment of translanguaging that I read um, gives virtually no mention of translation, uh, translation at all, but it ought, in fact, to be um, um, uh, regarded as something which could have a role in translanguaging. Um, using more than one language in class, whatever label we put on the practice, can indeed be uh, helpful and, and, and indeed sometimes necessary. Um, as Cree as Cree says, well, miscommunication threatens. Um, this has always been the case that the, the use of the first language can be u helped, used, used as a, an aid in cases of miscommunication. Where possible, um, that, that, that's a, a dimension we ought to think about too. Um, um, sometimes in, it's it's impossible. I mean, uh, you probably have the same situation in regard to Russian as we have in regard to English. The people, teachers, language, teachers of English, are sent around all around the world uh, to teach English to countries where they where they have no idea of of the of the languages spoken. Okay. Um, um, English teachers sent to China, for example, um, very often have no Chinese, okay? Um, and so translanguaging or any use of to the students that are one in that situation is a, an impossible dream. Um, in any case, okay, the preoccupation of language teachers has to go beyond trying to ensure the language content they provide is comprehensible. It, their task is to try and ensure that it's, it's mastered by the students. So the, it's not just a question of the teacher being understood by the students. The teacher has been doing things which help uh, the students to actually master elements of the, of the, the language they're, they're teaching. Uh, the, ed the editors of a recent book on trans translanguaging um, conclude that assessment um, is not, is, uh, ca cannot and should not be overlooked when considering pedagogical practices. Okay. Um, he, uh, they say that it's not just a question of um, being understood, but they have to uh, uh, teachers and teaching these languages have to advance a social justice agenda in education. That means um, helping um, the students in question to pass their exams. Uh, if, uh, if students don't actually advance in their educational career, social justice isn't well served. Okay, so it's it, the Translanguaging cannot ignore uh, the task of the language teacher, which is to get across and encourage the learning of uh, ele the elements of the language that the, the students came to learn. Uh, and um, so in other words, to show its worth, any version of transaction must demonstrate it can actually ensure mastery of those aspects of the language which the students came to the class to learn, and that it can take them through the exams in that um, language that they have to pass. 
So effectiveness and usefulness are the, are the criteria, not degree of fashionability. Translanguaging is very a very fashionable or term, a very fashionable idea, uh, and it's, it's uh, as I said at the beginning, it's everywhere mentioned, okay? But the, f the fact of an idea being fashionable is not enough to, to, um, to prove its worth, okay? Um, the, uh, after all, many versions and many uh, languages and methodologies in the past have been fashionable, uh, audio with ingualism, audio with, uh, the audiovisual teaching that I talked about before was very fashionable in the 1960s uh, in some countries, but it it it, um, it didn't necessarily do the job. It didn't. It wasn't necessarily effective. So, how many definitions exist for transcending? The essential challenge. Um, Influence was is not only um, it, 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 it not only that has it, it, it uh, is conceived of in a very in a variety of ways. So um, that's the essential challenge of, of transaction is not a matter of definition, not about a matter of the variety of conceptions it covers. The problem. Uh, may lie in a potential uh, failure to take account of the circumstances in which the pedagogical practice may or may not be so, so usefully implemented. So the originator of the term Ken Williams argues that transanguaging is most appropriate with a reason or with a, who already have a reasonable grasp of both languages. Okay. Um, he um, had the idea that translanguaging was not necessarily a methodology to be used in the early stages of school-based second language learning. He, he saw it as a, um, a practice which had a role where already both languages have been to some extent acquired by the students. And that, that position is still in line with the way um, the con uh, concept is used in many bilingual education programs, okay? which is, um, you know, uh, as we said at the beginning, where it, where it originates. Um, this simple solution, however, may not be the only possible answer, however. Um, to re return to our earlier discussion, the two criteria that any transanguaging pedagogy must meet uh, will be its capacity to provide target language comprehensible input. Okay, all all language pedagogies must provide comprehensible input, and secondly, its efficacy in promoting the learning of the target language. Okay. Uh, and these criteria apply to all language pedagogies, and, and translanguaging does not ex escape their challenging gaze. So what I'm saying is that <clears throat> translanguaging is fashionable, okay, and we have to recognize that. Uh, it has origins in a particular context, so the teaching of Welsh in, in, in Great Britain, and uh, in, in bilingual classroom situations, okay? Um, uh, so we have it, we know about its origins, but it's m more uh, extended use with the language teaching area um, must not become so fashionable that it moves away from the challenges that are always confront language teachers, okay? That is say, the provision of comprehensible input uh, to, the, uh, to the students, and also the, the ensuring that students have some chance of mastering what they come to the class to learn. I rest my case, thank you very much.
and we can we can perhaps have a, maybe some discussion um, if if there's time. Thank you. Okay, David, if you don't mind, please switch off your screen sharing regime in case you can see all the participants of our discussion. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so dear colleagues, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or you can text them in our chat. Okay, so we still can see your screen. Please turn it mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. I'll turn off the screen sharing regime, yep. I guess it should be somewhere at the top of the screen, a red button like stop screen sharing or something like that. And the stop sharing. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. Thank you really much. Okay, so and now please David check, you know, the chat. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we have the very first question. Oh, objections. I disagree with things I've said, but by all means, and tell me about your disagreements. Is, is translanguaging um, something which is uh, current, uh, currently being discussed in Russia? Anyone say? Anyone tell me whether translanguaging is 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 um, attracting the kind of attention that is attracting in in other countries in the West? Tell me how how different is it to bilingualism? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, uh, uh, def the, the definitions of translanguaging are various. Okay, so. Ken Williams, for Ken Williams, uh, he was using, he uh, was applicating a, um, um, a methodology which probably does correspond to what is done in most bilingual classrooms, okay? So he, he was uh, allowing the use of both languages in the classroom. Mm. Um, so that, 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 that's the basic early definition of it, but it, 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 it's, become, it's become a kind of, um, Buzz term in the West, anyway. Mm. Uh, it's been it's taken off because um, uh, it's been used in other spheres apart from pedagogy. Um, but um, it's just it, it's just a, it's a, the current buzz term. In, yeah. in, in, in if you look at if you look at articles produced in multilingualism education journals mm. uh, yeah. produced in the West. Uh, it appears in two, uh, three out of four. Uh, well, I know that's the aspiration, but it, it, it occurs in a lot of a lot of the titles of articles produced, uh, mm. uh, published in the West, uh, in in that in that sphere. You know. I did my master's de uh, degree in Lancaster in the 90s, so there was a lot of bilingualism, and I remembered that I analyzed postmodern literature like Nabokov. He's got this um, you know combination of three or four different languages it is different but it's a tool aesthetic tool uh, to show different distortions kind of James Joyce's uh, you know ability um, in Finnegan's wake you know when he combined many languages so I applied it not to pedagogy or not to the study of cognitive abilities and you know the um, possibility of combining different languages but how it works uh, you know, in a literary text. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. And it yeah. is the same in art. I think that they study um, the idea of, uh, I see here, uh, discretion, but it's, uh, it's different, uh, dispersion, when you get, uh, or oscillation, when you get, uh, you know, one thing getting into another, uh, one um, entity getting into another one, kind of dispersion and accumulation. Yes, well, maybe it's uh, you know, in the pedagogical sphere. It's uh, it's using the same ideas in in a, mm. or, uh, but anyway, that, um, the, the the there are various d definitions of of um, translanguaging, um, and I, I said at the beginning, beginning up to nearly twenty definitions of the topic. 
um, but uh, I was trying to keep it simple. But even um, the even the original uh, pedagogical um, definition of Zhangzhi still um, provokes some controversy, and and still needs looking at. You know, uh, um, so uh, yeah, yeah, and. Yeah, uh, as I've said, I don't want uh, to repeat myself. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Okay, now in the Soviet pedagogics, we have had a direct method when the mother tongue was banned from class. And yeah. the second approach, classical grammar method. Yeah. So is it trans is translanguaging something in between? Yeah, well, I mean, it goes, goes further. Well, the, 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 the direct method, actually, um, although it's advocated the teaching of the language through the language itself, they were not dog dogmatic in the sense they, 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 they accepted that in some cases you have to use the, the mother tongue to, just to get uh, comprehension um, across, um, uh, but there have been there are methodologies which which are very dogmatic. You know, uh, the audio audio lingual uh, methodology was was very dogmatic. You know, um, in terms of the use of um, the, the first language in second language classes. Okay, although. Although, I mean, um, I have some experience of teaching with, um, the, with in the audiolingual context. In in I was I was a language assistant in France in the early seventies, and at that time the Ministry of Education in France imposed audiolingual teaching all throughout the system. So, and um, uh, but teachers sort of used a certain amount of uh, pragmatism and in, in, they didn't follow the methodology strictly okay? and um, uh, so I think no matter what the the rules say no matter what the the imposition the, the, the degree of imposition of a particular methodology is teachers always find ways of doing their own thing you know so um, you see, yeah. the Russian tradition has always been to teach kind of audiolingual, so it's it's, uh, it's uh, very different from designer methods. But as you remember, there were teachers were individuals, and then of course with communicative approach, with task based, with lexical approach, it's all changed. But yeah. uh, a great majority of Russian teachers uh, or university teachers, they still remember older traditions. So it's in Russia, it is all always a combination you see yeah, so we have yeah. a lot of translation classes even if they are not in the syllabus and even though uh, communicative methodology has been you know implemented uh, for the last 10 or 15 years it is still there so you would always have a lot of translation and therefore first language you know instruction yeah I, 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 that's my experience with teachers too they always do their own thing you know mm. Um, but um, the question is, uh, in, the, in the light of that, is it um, really reasonable to impose a particular methodology? Translanguaging is looser than that. Okay? Uh, Translanguaging doesn't impose a methodology. Translanguaging suggests, for example, um, the, the use of both languages in the class, okay? which, which is reasonable in the sense that Always, in fact, language teachers have used both languages, both the L1, L2, for their purposes in the class. You know, um, or or the dogmatists, the dogmatists have been rare amongst teachers. I think the people who follow a particular dogma in in language teaching are rare. Okay, normally teachers find their ways and. Uh, um, find their way of doing things which corresponds to what they're used to and what, what the thing works, you know. Do you agree with that? I think it was yesterday during the plenary session there was this wild guess 
about generation gap that people of all the generation they prefer like myself i would prefer to listen uh, but uh, younger they called it z generation they prefer to discuss things in groups or pairs so it's certainly target orientated very much i expect a lot of input so i was very happy to listen to your lectures and i think it's the same uh, with many teachers but uh, younger students would be always very happy to discuss and make their own contribution, even without much preparation. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Any other thoughts? Um, so, what's what? What's, can I ask? What situation in Russia is now? I mean, it, you use communicative language teaching. That that is also a, a term which has many definitions, of course. Yeah, yeah, it's still, it was um, actually by force at some point. I went to study in Britain at a time when it was very much of a, you know, a British <laughs> occupation, I would say, in ELT. And uh, it has been there in secondary schools as well as in higher education ever since, because instead of GCSE, we introduced what is called YIGE. So it's communicative approach because of the syllabus design and because of the books. But mm. universities traditionally, they maintain uh, this uh, teachers and instructors. So professors certainly act like researchers, teachers, uh, coaches. So you would have both. But uh, in the conversational classes, of course, because of Cambridge examinations, they do have most of the classes would be communicative. Yes. Because um, of the I, materials and the syllabus. Um, can I ask what the situation is with regard to translation? Translation? Mm. Uh, it's, I've been to one of the conferences and uh, they were very good at pointing out details and saying how important it is to maintain it, how important it is to search for one word. Uh, but at another conference, it just looked as if, you know, we don't need any translation at all because everything is computer generated. Yeah. I remember we have Silver Age, it's kind of equivalent to modernist era. And we have a famous uh, poet who would say that to translate real care, you don't have to translate, you know, completed works. You've got to fall in love with one particular poem and then translate it. So there are talks like that, but it is still quite um, uh, old fashioned, isn't it? Because of, you know, computer generation translation is getting uh, more and more, uh, you know, widely recognized. But we do have a lot of translation classes as well as interpreting. In, 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 universi in universities and schools or just universities? At the universities, yes. Yeah. State universities. I'm from St. Petersburg State University, so we have very strong tradition of translation. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, I, I, I remember learning languages in the 60s in England where I, where I did a lot of translation at school, you know, and uh, it, I, I don't think it did harm. Um, but... Um, we, uh, maybe we should get a get a more balanced perspective on translation. You know, I think it's a it, it's um, we we use we use computers for translation these days. But uh, what in the sense of the one of the one of the things that someone who knows language is often called to called to do upon to do is to translate or interpret when uh, the other language, his other language or her other language is, is being um, being used um, by someone, they, you know. I mean, for example, you, you, you're, you're, you, I, I speak French quite well, you know, I'm often asked to, to, to uh, translate into French for the benefit of a French uh, hearer, something that the uh, my the asker wants to wants to wants to say you know so it's uh, an, uh, uh, it's uh, a frequent task that's often called um, often asked of someone who knows a foreign language so it's not just about uh, computer uh, okay uh, David, can i ask a question which is not related to pedagogy uh, because translanguaging in Russia uh, has three dimensions, like immigrants talking Russian and their natural language, their native language, um, uh, borrowed signs on the street signs, like um, on the main streets of Moscow, the names of restaurants, which are an example of translanguaging, and probably uh, like all uh, small um, 
nations inside um, ethnic societies within Russia. They just tra- they do lots of translanguaging. Yeah. Um, so, but uh, relate. Uh, so, I would like to ask you, um, what's your opinion about the difference between uh, like transsematized signs and translanguaging? For example, I gave an example in the chat. Like, there are signs in Moscow. For example, the name of the shop, which is called Zas Food, and mm-hmm. which is which could be translated like I support sport, but it's in English. So is it still an example of translanguaging? And if yes, why yes? If not, why no? No, I, I, I uh, think translanguaging has escaped the classroom. You know, it's 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 it, you being used to describe practices um, in the naturalistic sphere. Okay. Um, and uh, I uh, would certainly see they would certainly see that what you the example you've given of, of, of as, as translanguaging. I mean, you know, there are, as I said, there are so many definitions of translanguaging. It's bewildering. I mean, uh, up to I think there are seventeen definitions that have been encountered by a colleague of mine. Um, uh, but um, so, uh, uh, but definitions are, aren't really the point what we're talking about this use of more than one language in a particular context and um, obviously uh, naming shops and you know that kind of thing are examples of using language more than one language in well sometimes it's more than two languages indeed you know um uh, the, the interesting uh, the interesting uh, you talk about um the situation in Russia with regard to um, different languages used in German locations. But as uh, our, this, our speaker yesterday said, in, in Britain and Ireland, there are so many languages spoken on the, in, in the, on the streets of, of London and Dublin okay, these days that translanguaging in, in the broad sense is everywhere, you know. Uh, and there, there are there are there, there are schools, the primary schools in Ireland now, where the majority of the pupils pupils are not first language speakers of English. Okay, so um, that has to be taken into account. How is another question. How is another question. One one thing that's often done is to try to um, um, valorize the languages of the, the pupils by putting various. Um, Signs and and um, charts up, which um, which are in the languages of of the of the, uh, the other languages of of the pupils. I think that helps, but uh, that's that's again the kind of use of translanguage. You know, it's, it's, it's not it's used pedagogically, but uh, the 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 term is um, a useful one for for covering all these other cases. Any more bright ideas? <laughs> there is also a question in the chat about the difference between translanguaging and transcreation. Uh, transcreation. Uh, so I don't, I don't know what it, what this means. Sorry, what transcreation? There is a question in the chat. So have you looked at it? Have you noticed it? Oh, no, I haven't. Yeah, that was a question from Ms. Pesina. If you don't mind, please, uh, Ms. Pesina, can you expand on this uh, definition? Can you give us the definition of transcreation? Uh, uh, wait a minute. I don't know the term transcreation. And I'm very frank with you. I don't, I, that, it's a new one on me. Um, is uh, transcreation. What, where have we got uh, any kind of references to a transcreation? Because I don't know it. Transcreation. Well, unfortunately, the author of the question is, you know, keeping silent. That's the point. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 the charm is new for me, I, I must say. Um, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I had to admit in ignorance, but I, yes, I don't know it. 
it's not a sham that's it's, it's widely used in in, in in the literature and in, in, in uh, English speaking areas anyway. So dear colleagues, do you have any other questions? Because we have well, a lot of time left. Hmm. They want coffee rather than questions, maybe. <laughs> well, thank you for your attention, and um, I hope I have uh, given thing, given uh, some things to talk about, uh, to, uh, to, to think about. I mean, uh, uh, this challenging idea is is a big one in in the West, and uh, I think it, it's um, I think probably too big in a sense, where it's used in so many different ways, but. Uh, and the pedagogical sphere is, is worth looking at, both from, from the point of view of um, uh, re-evaluating re previous methodologies, maybe, and uh, from the point of view, just generally, uh, of um, giving a break to, to the first languages of the pupils in the classroom and uh, allowing them some, some, some room. So anyway, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah, thank you. You too.